Welcome to the January 8, 2009, or 2000, yes, 2009 edition of the Open Forum. Again, we have the uh, privilege and the, and the uh, uh, wonder of it all of being able to look together into the Word of God into, and uh, to discover truth. Now, last evening, a, a caller called about 1 Corinthians 11, where there is a verse that uh, we have always taught, because that's the way it's written in the King James Bible and other Bibles as well, uh, that uh, it is by nature, uh, it shows us that long hair is not proper for a man. And I can tell you that that for years and years that is exactly what I taught because that is what the Bible apparently was saying here in 1 Corinthians 11. There we read in verse 14, Doth not nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? Yet when we go to the original language, and we have to always check that out on anything that if we're really going to uh, make sure that we are coming to truth, because even a prestigious uh, translation like the King James, and it is amongst the translations a prestigious translation, but it too uh, has errors in it. Very, not very often, not very often, but once in a while it does. And this is one of them in which somehow the translators were influenced. We can speculate, but my guess is they were uh, heavily influenced by the uh, uh, the church of that day, which well, the, the dominant church was the Roman Catholic Church, uh, and in the uh, for perhaps in the Latin version of this passage, this is the way they had translated that that it was not right for a man to have long hair. However, when we go to the original language and look at it very carefully, it really is saying uh, the first word in this verse is a word that can be translated either as or, 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 or what. Either way, uh, it can read or not, or not once. Excuse me, I'm getting started wrong myself. Or not even nature itself does teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a dishonor to him. Or that could be translated, what not even nature itself does teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a dishonor to him. And uh, there's, this, there's nothing in the Bible anywhere that teaches that long hair is a disgrace. As I indicated last evening, the uh, Nazarenes, uh, those who took a Nazarite vow, rather, they let their hair grow like Samson let his hair grow. Uh, and uh, there's just not anything in the Bible that implies that long hair is a disgrace of any kind. And uh, so today... Uh, if a man wants to wear long hair, he may do so, so insofar as the Bible is concerned. Now, his family may not like it or his friends may not like it. That's his problem. But insofar as the Bible is concerned, no, there is nothing in the Bible that says that a man cannot have long hair. But uh, shall we go to our first caller tonight? Uh, uh, good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening. Could you help me um, with two scriptures? The first one is Genesis seventeen twenty-five. Genesis seventeen twenty-five. There we read. And Ishmael, his son, was thirteen years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. Okay, and in combination with Genesis twenty-one fourteen through twenty-one. Genesis 21, 14, there we read, Genesis 21, 14, 
And Abram rose up early in the morning and took bread and a bottle of water and gave it unto Hagar. Now, incidentally, uh, so that we fill in the uh, context here, uh, uh, Ishmael was born to Abraham by Hagar, who was his maid, or Sarah's maid, uh, and that was an attempt by Abraham to bring about the promise that his seed would be a multitude of uh, nations, and and yet his wife, true wife Sarah had not born any children, and she was beyond the age of childbearing, and so finally Ishmael uh, was born uh, to Abraham uh, uh, through Hagar, and uh, and uh, then. Uh, long after that, after uh, then God gave a son also to Sarah. That son was a miraculous son. She was beyond the age of childbearing, but it was the promised son. And uh, then Ishmael, uh, who uh, finally was 13 years old, and uh, about the time uh, I think uh, the, the son of Sarah was born, and he began to ridicule uh, uh, Isaac and became a real nuisance in the family. And Sarah couldn't stand it. And she asked Abraham, is it possible that Hagar could be uh, removed from being in the family? And Abraham agreed to that. And so uh, it, uh, uh, it, it was very grievous in Abraham's sight. Uh, because he loved Ishmael just like he loved Isaac. And we read in verse 12, And God said unto Abraham, Let it not be grievous in thy sight because of the lad, that is Ishmael, and because of thy bondwoman, who was Hagar. In all that Sarah has said unto thee, hearken unto her voice, for in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Now the verse uh, 13 and also of the son of the bondwoman will I make a nation, because he is thy seed. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and took bread and a bottle of water and gave it unto Hagar, putting it on her shoulder and the child, and sent her away. And she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. And the water was spent in the bottle, and the... And the and she cast the child under one of the shrubs, and she went and sat down over against him a good way off, as if it were a bow shot. For she said, Let me not see the death of the child, because she was convinced that uh, Ishmael would die. And she sat over against him and lifted up her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the lad. And the angel of God called to Hagar out of heaven and said to her, said unto her, What aileth thee, Hagar? Fear not, for God hath heard the voice of the lad where he is. Arise, lift up the lad, and hold him in thine hand, for I will make him a great nation. Incidentally, that phrase, great nation, meant that someday the descendants of Ishmael, thy son, are also going to be part of the kingdom of God, because this is a phrase that is applied in the Bible only to those who are citizens of the kingdom of God. It didn't mean that Ishmael would be in the kingdom of God, but his progeny, his descendants at some point, and the other passages of the Bible emphasize it's in our day that this is true. Descendants of Ishmael are, are uh, also coming into the body of believers uh, in a great way in our day. The Bible teaches that. And God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water, and she went and filled the bottle with water and gave the lad to drink. And God was with the lad, and he grew and dwelt in the wilderness and became an archer. And he dwelt in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother took him a wife out of the land of Egypt. Now, what is your question? Yes, I guess I was confused because I was assuming that at the, at, during this period of time that he was a small child almost a baby, but obviously this was after he was circumcised when he was 13. So actually when they're calling him a lad, he's actually a teenager at this point? Yeah. He was uh, he was 13 years of age at this time, uh, and uh, but uh, 
uh, the wilderness. It was like a desert, and and uh, Hagar was in in total uh, depression because of what had happened to her, and so I thought for sure that Ishmael would die. And then God, in His wonderful mercy, intervened and, and spoke directly to her, uh, giving her these promises. Okay, thank you. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Mr. Camping? Yes. Um, last night, a caller asked you for information about the King James Bible. And I think it was very false of you to give him the information. The King James Version of the Bible was written before three of the greatest codexes were found. Well, excuse me, I don't know where you're getting your information, but we know this, that when we check the Greek that God, that was used in, in uh, writing the King James Bible, uh, we find that it identifies with the Greek, uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, earliest Greek that was the copies that were as old as uh, the second or, or before the third century after Christ, and and we uh, and then when we go to the tr see oneself carefully, they translated it. Normally, it was done very carefully. Although I demonstrated this evening, uh, that here in First uh, Corinthians uh, 14 or First Corinthians 11, they. Uh, somehow did a poor job of translation, but that that was reasonably unusual. Normally, uh, they have done a very excellent job. They did a very excellent job of translation. Translation. Hello. Yes. There are three codexes: the Alexandrian, the Vatican, and the Sinaiticus. The, well, the Sinaiticus, the Sinaiticus, for example, that was in the Latin. That came later. That uh, that is used as the authority, uh, one of the major authorities for the NIV and uh, m uh, many of the modern Bibles that we have today. And they make big claims about that. I, I'm very familiar with that, those claims uh, that they, they went back to the earliest Greek. And that is not so. It is not so. They went back to the earliest uh, Greek that came from the Latin translation that was uh, uh, included the uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the codexes that were find, found on on what the, the church called Mount Sinai and in Egypt. Uh, the, it was not in it was not the Mount Sinai uh, where uh, Moses was, but they thought it was. But anyway, that just Mr. shows Campy? the confusion. Hello? Yes. The, uh, the Codex Alexandrinus was discovered in 1627. That's 16 years after the King James Version. The Codex Vaticanus was discovered in 1843, and the Codex Sinaiticus was discovered in 1844. The King James Version could not use these authentic manuscripts. It, it did not use these. It did not use these. But in today, for example, you can go into various museums in England or even in some of the museums of the United States, and you'll find fragments of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, that have been found that uh, date like uh, uh, under 200 A.D., and that identifies with the Greek that the King James Bible used. The King James Bible had nothing to do with those four codexes that you are naming. You are correct. It had nothing to do with them. But they, they all identify with the, with the uh, translations that we have today, like the NIV. They claim that that is the earliest. But that is not, that is not the earliest. It's the earliest after... The uh, Latin uh, uh, translation had been made by the early Roman Catholic Church, and uh, 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 like the Vulgate version, and uh, and it identifies with them. But thank you for calling and sharing. 
And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Harold. How are you doing this evening? Very well, thank you. Okay, I have uh, two questions. The first question is, when Jesus, between the time when Jesus was born up until he started performing miracles, what was his role and what was he doing, like as eight years old, ten years old, a teenager? What was he performing and what was he doing at that time? Oh, well, the Bible tells us, you know, he in uh, the Gospel of Luke... Let me see if I can find that. I think it's around Luke 4. Luke 4, maybe. There we read. There we read. um, No, it wasn't Luke 4. It was Luke... uh, Anyway, it was someplace early there in Luke. And he came uh, to uh, Nazareth where he had... uh, uh, where he had come as a young child, probably about five or six years of age, out of Egypt, and uh, with his with his um, mother and stepdad Joseph, and uh, there he worked as a carpenter or as a brick mason or in construction work of one kind or another. We know that because when he came, finally, uh, officially now is is preaching the, the gospel, he came to Luke, uh, to, or excuse me, to Nazareth, and he spoke in the synagogue there. And, uh, and uh, the people were, were shocked and amazed at his teaching and said, Is this not the son of Joseph, the, the, uh, the carpenter, the uh, brick mason? Or the, uh, it's a word that means he was in some kind of construction. And so he... And uh, uh, elsewhere, we read in in Luke chapter two, where it says that uh, uh, in Luke chapter two, it it it, it that, that he dwelt. You know, let me see with verse twenty, verse. Oh my, I haven't looked at these verses for some time. But in Luke chapter 2, we read that he, uh, he became subject to his parents. He became subject to his parents. In other words, he was just a son in the home. He had brothers and sisters that finally were also born to Mary and Joseph. And he was uh, uh, working in his dad's little business when some kind of a construction business, and until he was, we know if we work through the timeline of this very accurately, we find that he was just a few days before 35 years of age when he came to John the Baptist by the River Jordan, and there he, it was announced, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. This was his official beginning as a uh, 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 presenting himself as the savior to the world. Okay, my my second question is: Do you think you could speculate on this at, at the dark during the dark ages? You belong, you believe it's possible that there's a missing part of the Bible that explains what was going on during the dark ages, or that's just God's business? I, I don't know what was going on in the dark ages. There's no missing part of the Bible, of course, because the Bible is God's Word. God wrote the Bible. Man did not write the Bible. Man did not put the Bible together. <laughs> there are those who make that claim and try to make that, make that stand, but that's not possible. Because this is God's book. He is the author. And so uh, everything we find in our Bible was already there uh, on the day that the final final chapter, the last chapter of Revelation was written. Uh, uh, The whole Bible was there. And uh, 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 any claim that the Bible was put together by somebody in the church is just not true. All right, thank you for taking my call. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Now the word God, Father, Lord, Son, Jehovah, Holy Spirit, is used interchangeably in the Bible and refers to one person. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Now, in Matthew 3, 16 and 17 that you quote, it says, when he went to be baptized, the Spirit descended upon him, and he saw the heavens open, and a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved Son. And you emphasize always that not Jesus, but a voice from heaven. Now, in order to refute that, in John 12:28, he said, the Lord Jesus Christ, Father, glorify thy name. And he, this voice answered him. He said, I, ha- I will glorify it, I, and I have glorified it, and will glorify it again. Now, he did this same thing on Matthew 17, 5, when Moses and Elijah was before him in the cloud, and a voice from heaven spoke. And when all was done, only one person was seen. I'm sorry, what is your question that you want to ask? I'm developing it. And my point is this. You emphasize in Mark, 14, uh, Mark 4, 11, and 12 that Jesus spoke to them in parables, and he said, It is appointed unto you to know the mysteries. All right. So if John 3.16 is a mystery, what voice is speaking? Is it the Father's voice or the Lord Jesus' voice? Well, excuse me. Now, you see, your problem is you're, you're, we're trying to understand God, and we can't understand God. He is a divine mystery. Uh, uh, the fact that the Bible clearly teaches there is one God, like we read, for example, in Colossians of the Lord Jesus Christ, in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Uh, we, uh, and yet Christ said, and Christ said, I and the Father are one. If any man has seen me, he has seen the Father. Uh, and yet at the same time, uh, God clearly un- uh, emphasizes that God reveals himself as three persons, as you've already indicated, the F- Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we cannot reconcile those verses together. There's, it's impossible. Our God has not given us a mind that is brilliant enough. Nobody has that kind of a mind that we can understand God. We read these statements in the Bible and we say, wow, uh, I don't know how that is, but it is true because the Bible says it is true. When we talk about God, when the Bible talks about God, we better not try to figure out how that all ties together because we're going to get into it. We're going to be again to teach wrong things. Without question, we will teach wrong things because our minds are unable, are unqualified, are undesigned, or have not been designed to understand a personality as great as infinite God who could speak and bring this complex universe into existence. And if we can't understand how we could do that, how could we understand him himself then? It's impossible. We have to walk very humbly and say, uh, yes, that's what the Bible says. It's absolutely true, but I don't understand how it can be. Answer you. Can I answer that question? Go to Second Corinthians 4, 3 and 4. Second Corinthians 4, verse 3 and 4. Yes, read it out. Yes, now there we read, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Uh, and indeed... That we could say, well, God is here teaching that we should be able to understand everything. But you know, we also have to read uh, Deuteronomy chapter <coughs> chapter hmm, what is it? Chapter thirty-three. They where God uh, says. Hmm, 
Oh, boy, there again. I've got a verse that uh, oh. that says that says uh, the secret things belong to God, and there are certain things that are secret and will remain secret. There are other things that have been secret, an enormous amount of material has remained sacred until our day, and now God is opening our eyes to it. But, uh, uh, but uh, we want to make sure that we don't decide what God is going to tell us. Uh, that's not our role. That's God's role. He's the one who makes the decision what we are to know. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, uh, Brother Campen. I yeah. did have a question, sir. Could you please read from Exodus 31, verse 16? Exodus 31, verse 16. Yes, sir. There we read, Wherefore the children of, the Israel, of Israel shall keep the Sabbath, to observe the Sabbath throughout their generation for a perpetual covenant. The word covenant is a synonym for the word law. It is a law that is uh, to be observed forever, that, the, that uh, we keep that Sabbath. Now, yes, that's sir. talking about the seventh-day Sabbath. Yes, sir. That that was my concern, sir, because I was wondering why they changed the Sabbath to the first day instead of the seventh day. Because Christ spoke in parables. And you see, in the Old Testament, there are many uh, uh, historical things that were done that uh, had no substance in themselves, but were pointing to something spiritual. Uh, for example... Uh, when someone was circumcised. That didn't accomplish anything in the life of an individual, except that he had the pain of the, of the operation. Uh, but it was pointing to the fact that even as the foreskin of the reproductive organ was cut off, so our sins have to be cut off. Hold on, I'll finish answering this right after this message. Incidentally, the verse I was looking for in Deuteronomy is Deuteronomy 29, verse 29. The secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do the, all the words of this law. And notice again, it says that uh, they may uh, that they belong to our you, us and our children forever the law of god it goes on into eternity it doesn't stop here it is the law the, from the mouth of god and god is under that same law that we are under uh, the law of god now we were speaking about this verse that had to do with with the sa sabbath day uh, you see uh, it it was part of the ceremonial law in the old testament it like, uh, for example, the law to offer a burnt offering. Now that burnt offering was pointing to the Lord Jesus, and and the uh, Christ is the burnt offering forever and ever for those who have become saved. Uh, uh, but it was it was attested to. It was anticipated uh, by the fact that Israel had to offer a burnt offering. Now the same with the seventh day Sabbath. The seventh day Sabbath was to be strictly observed as a ceremonial law until Christ uh, was de came and demonstrated how he suffered for our sins. And, and it, it demonstrated, it in turn, the seventh day, the observance of the seventh day Sabbath uh, demonstrated that we are not to do any work in trying to get ourselves saved. Uh, we read in Numbers 15 where a man uh, picked up a few sticks on the seventh day Sabbath and God gave the order to execute him, to have him stoned to death. And he was stoned to death. It's like saying if someone is going to trust in any way in something I have done to become saved, we're still under the wrath of God. We're still subject 
to the death penalty. We are not saved. And this goes right on into eternity. The fact is that that is a principle, that all the work of saving us, we must and will understand as children of God, was completely, 100%, total, totally completed by the work of the Lord Jesus. And so, spiritually, we continue forever to observe the seventh-day Sabbath, but not literally at all. If we're trying to do it literally, then we're denying uh, that Christ has done all the work for us. Then we are, uh, are trying to create our own salvation plan. But, I understand. Uh, thank you, Brother Campy. I guess my concern was because God made it a commandment, and no other commandment I don't believe that I know of has ever been changed or anything. So I just wanted to make sure because I had a problem understanding that. Well, it's uh, uh, the fact is we don't observe uh, circumcision anymore. We don't observe burnt offerings anymore. There are all kinds of ceremonial laws. No, that were true. a shadow of things to come. And just, yeah, uh, uh, this, excuse me, the seventh day Sabbath command was exactly like all the other ceremonial law commands. Thank you, Brother Camping. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, Camping. Yes. Yeah. Doing a good job. Tell me something. Yeah, what is your where, question? Where the Bible is uh, God takes care of the people with disabilities? Where does it say that God takes care of people with disabilities? Right. Well, for there example, the Bible about that? Uh, for example, in Exodus 4, in Exodus 4, here is Moses who is... Uh, uh, you're being asked of God or commanded by God to go to Egypt to uh, lead the the nation of Israel out of Egypt. And Moses is protesting. He said uh, uh, in verse 10 of Exodus 4, Lord, oh my Lord, or, or Jehovah, oh my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither heretofore nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. In other words, he must have had some kind of a speech impediment. And Jehovah said unto him, Who hath made man's mouth? Or who maketh the dumb, or the deaf, or the seeing, or the blind? Have not I, Jehovah? Now therefore go, and I will be with thy mouth and teach thee what thou shalt say. And you see, uh, God knows all about our physical disabilities, and that doesn't restrain Him at all from using us in His kingdom activity. Why is people outside keep people with disabilities down? Why do people keep disabilities? Yeah. yeah. Oh well. The, that's another matter altogether. That uh, 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 some people feel that they can't get a full day's work out of a disabled person, and some have some other reason. You have to ask them. I can't. I can't speak for their minds. Uh, but uh, uh, if a person is uh, if a person is able to be used in some service, and there are, you, let me tell you, there are companies that make it a point. Uh, to try to use disabled people uh, that I know of for a fact. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Brother Campy. Yes. Hey, how you doing? I'm very well, thank you. Oh, uh, it's so good to talk to you again. A uh, long time since I last called in, which was back in June. And I just got to tell you that I definitely see God working through you and uh, it's just an honor, again, to, to be able to speak to you once again. Uh, uh, you, you feeling okay, at least? I'm, uh, the Lord has been very gracious to me. He, his uh, mercy is very great in my life. And thank you for calling. Anytime, sir. Well, a couple of questions I have for you real quick. Um, I was wanted you to check out Joel 
chapter 2, verses 28 through 31. Joel, chapter 8. No, no, chapter 2. Chapter 2, rather. Um, verse verse 8. Tw- uh, verse 28 through 31. Verse 28, Joel chapter 2, verse 28. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions. And also upon thy, the servants and upon the handmaidens in those days will I pour out my Spirit, and I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth blood and fire and pillars of smoke the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come now what is your question uh, my question is two things on this one uh, on, on verse 30 when you, you receive the word heavens with the S there at the end of it is that to mean that there are more than one heaven I, I'm a little confused with that well First of all, heavens have to do. Uh, there, uh, the Bible speaks of Genesis chapter one. In the beginning, God created the heavens. Uh, the Bible, the Bibles translate that in the singular, but it actually is a plural word. Created the heavens and the earth. In First uh, Corinthians chapter twelve or eleven, I believe, it speaks about the third heaven where God is. So we normally think about heavens, that's the physical creation, where the birds fly, where our atmosphere area, that is the first heaven, and way out in deep space where the galaxies are, that would be the second heaven. Uh, It's part of our universe. And then the third heaven, uh, which was not created at the beginning, uh, that, uh, that is where God dwells. Now here, I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth. That is in the universe. There will be wonders and one of the, and, but remember, Christ spoke in parables. We have to be careful. Uh, we can look at this and immediately think physical. Are there going to be cosmic activities? Are there going to be uh, special eclipses? Are there going to be uh, comets or that, uh, that suddenly show up? And when we study the rest of the Bible, and we always have to do that uh, when we're trying to determine the meaning of any verse, we find that, no, there's nothing in in the Bible that suggests any change before the uh, day of judgment begins or even before the, the, uh, the final end of the day of judgment, which is October 21, uh, 2011 there will be any change in the physical heavens. The, uh, uh, but, but the physical heavens is where the sun and the moon are and the stars, and he uses uh, those as, as uh, pictures of uh, those who claim to be identified with the kingdom of God. And uh, we do find verses that say that the sun will be darkened and the moon will be turned to blood or it will not shine. Uh, we find verses that the stars will fall. And all of this is spiritual. It is talking about the fact that the gospel will be totally silenced in the world when, uh, when uh, the rapture occurs and when the day of judgment begins. Oh, okay. Because I was kind of confused uh, with the part where, uh, for instance, verse 28 there at the end there where it said young men shall see visions because I remember you would always say that um, any vision this day and age would come from the devil not from a God well, well because... now, now we have a different subject altogether this actually is a, a very interesting passage it was quoted in Acts chapter 2 when the Holy Spirit was poured out at the very first day of the church age except that there was a modification Instead of saying, and afterwards, uh, when God quoted it in Acts 2, he said, in the last days, in the latter days, I will pour out my spirit. And so that meant that this passage really has two fulfillments. Two times, and we have to, of course, develop this by looking elsewhere also in the Bible, but 
there are two times when the Holy Spirit was poured out. Uh, and uh, when the Holy Spirit is poured out, it means that we begin to get an understanding of the Word of God, uh, typified by uh, as if uh, uh, we are, are uh, uh, getting messages from God in dreams or visions. Now, there are no more dreams or visions. That was the way God did bring uh, truth uh, in, throughout the Old Testament period, but that's not possible once the church age began, nor is it possible in the year 1994 when God again poured out the Holy Spirit. We know that that was the year because that was the, the beginning of the final 6,100 days of the 8,400-day Great Tribulation period. And during that 6,100 days, uh, while the churches remained under the authority of Satan, and the world did too, but out in the world, God began here uh, this tremendous plan of uh, saving a great multitude which no man could number uh, that are presently being saved because the Holy Spirit had been poured out again. Right. Well, Brother Kathy, I know you got a lot of calls waiting. I just got one more question. Um, my mother is a widow. I lost my dad to cancer about 10 years ago. Um, I'm a young guy. I like to say I'm young. I'm 35. And my mom uh, has been devoted to reading her Bible, uh, you know, praying, uh, recently, she met a young man, a younger man, who is wanting to take her to church, uh, wanting to get her out of the house, but he was divorced. He was divorced from his wife. Uh, the wife is still living, from what I understand. W what advice can you... Uh, well, first of all, you don't want to have any romance beginning, and if he is divorced uh, and he is very kind to her... He may eventually have marriage intentions, and you don't even want to see that develop. You want to discourage your mother on that score. Secondly, if he wants to take her to a church, that's the worst possible uh, possible place to take her because Satan rules there. And so this individual that wants to call your, uh, be friendly with your mom, he may have the goodness of his heart, but he doesn't understand what the Bible is teaching. I don't know whether your mother does either, but but the fact is you uh, you have heard it definitely because you're a listener to Family Radio that uh, we never want to be in any kind of a church. So you have uh, if you're his her son, and of course you are, then you want to get have some serious conversation with your mother about these things. But you also want to make sure that you are uh, are faithful yourself. You don't want to tell your mom. Uh, well, you can't take it. You don't want to go to a church because Satan rules there. If you are still going to a church, because that will be completely hypocritical. But thank you for calling in, Sherry. All right, Brother Kathy. And thank shall you. we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yeah, Mr. Kathy, how are you doing? Very you, well, thank you. You just uh, mentioned Deuteronomy 29, 29, about the secret things belong to God. Yeah. And, uh, right? Is that what you read, right? Twenty nine, twenty nine. Yes, I read from that. I quoted from that. That's where God is indicating that there are certain things that are secret. Now, uh, one of the things that is especially in view is God Himself. We we don't. It's very obvious when we read everything about God in the Bible is peppered, just peppered, is filled with information about God doing this and being that and so on. And if 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 you really begin to try to think, well, now I'm going to try to understand God. I'm just going to study, study, study the Bible, and I'm going to try to harmonize these verses together and come so that I really can say I understand God. It is absolutely impossible. It's impossible because God is an infinite being. And like I say, we can't even understand how he could speak and bring all the goldfish into existence and bring all the pollywogs and all the uh, uh, the uh, 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 rabbits and all uh, all the other forms of but life that, that, and that's, that's, part, that's part of my question why I wanted to ask you. You know, because I hear you say that with one side, then I other side I hear you saying that the Lord has revealed some things to you. And the, the question I wanted to ask you was, 
Because when you say that uh, the world's going to end in May uh, two eleven, May twenty one, and if Jesus says no man knows the day, only my Father, which is in heaven, knows it, then you turn around and say you know it. I'm saying uh, something's wrong with that picture. Well, what's 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 wrong is is that you're not reading the whole Bible. The Bible does say right up until the end, for anyone who is still without salvation, whose mind is darkened by sin, who is not in the light of the gospel, Christ is going to come as a thief in the night. Uh, because he, they do not know. They don't want to know. They think that that's what the Bible teaches, and that's as much as they understand about that. But that does not mean that if we're a child of the day, a child of the light, uh, there God says we are watching and we will know. So take your pick. If you want to stay with the, uh, if you want to uh, uh, insist Christ is coming as a thief in the night, well, fine, he'll come as a thief in the night for you. You won't anticipate his coming and, and you're going to be, find out that you're still included. Let me amongst ask the you a question here. This other question, Mr. Campy. Well, if that's the case, then, now, wouldn't Jesus would have said, well, somebody does know, somebody else does know, cause, well, he's saying a, a non-truth. If he's saying no man knows, then you turn well, around well, and say, Well, no, excuse me. For, uh, secondly, it doesn't say no man can know. It says some, nobody knows, just like Romans chapter 3. Remember, it says that there is none righteous, no, not one. Wait a minute, wait a minute. All kinds of true believers are righteous. How can God say that? Is he saying, what he's saying is, is that there was a time when, that is, at the beginning, as in Adam, all day, die, where there is none righteous. But he's not saying nobody can be righteous. Uh, that it doesn't say that. And so... Uh, throughout the history of the world, there are people who did become righteous. And so when he says Christ is coming as a thief in the night, or nobody knows when he will come, he's not saying that, that there will never come a time when we can know. We can't read more into those verses than that is there. And the Bible very clearly indicates that we, that we will know, that we will, that uh, he gives, uh, in fact, two magnificent illustrations when the world was destroyed by the flood of Noah's day they knew the exact day when this was going the flood waters would come when God was ready to destroy uh, the city of Nineveh in the days of Jonah as we read in the book of Jonah they knew the day that they were to be destroyed and, uh, and those are illustrations and so uh, if today if we uh, if we listen to the Bible and if we're if we're uh, uh, a true child of God, we will know. Just like we read in Revelation chapter three, where it says, uh, "If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come upon thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee," which should directly implies that. But if you are watching, you will know when he is coming. He says the same thing in 1 Thessalonians 5. Uh, while those who are uh, still in the nighttime of unbelief, he will come as a thief in that nighttime. But ye are children of the light and of the, of the day. And you are watching. And it's a different situation for you. And that's why, uh, and we have to know, if somebody has to know in order to warn the world, like uh, like uh, Noah warned the world and Jonah warned the city of Nineveh, so the true believers have to warn the world that that day is uh, such and such a day and it is coming. And we are not included in the, amongst those uh, who, for whom he'll come as a thief in the night. Well, Mr. Campy, but, I'd like to say this to you. My last statement here, my last point here I'd like to make. You know, I, I know you've written a lot of books, and uh, um, and but when it, and I hear you too loud and clear when you say tell the people uh, it's not me or uh, read the Bible, read the Bible, read the Bible. Well, see now, here's a choice I have to make. I either can believe what you say, 
or I can believe what the Word of God says. And I, and I want you to know, man to man, I choose to believe what the Word of God says. Yeah, but excuse me, why does God give us teachers? Are they just foolishness? The Bible clearly teach, teaches that He gave uh, uh, teachers to the world. Now, why did He do that? In order to help guide us into the Word of God. The teachers did not become the authority. Oh, there are all kinds of teachers and preachers and evangelists who claim they are the authority. That's all haywire. That's all wrong. But a, a, a legitimate teacher very humbly says, Look, I have found this in the Word of God. If you are interested in that, this is where to look. And that, uh, that is the role of a teacher. They, they point constantly, a true teacher points to the fact it is the Bible that is the authority, not the teacher. Uh, and so please, uh, just uh, if you read anything that was produced by Family Radio, it is there not to be the authority. It is only to point people to what the Bible is teaching. And then you make your own decision as you read these things in the Bible. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello? Hello. Oh, uh, yes. My name is Raymond. Um, I have a question. I attend a church where church service is very reverent and quiet. But um, I visited a friend's church, and they speak tongues, and they shout. But I was wondering, like, what is the right way to worship God? Well, the problem is that you're, you're attending uh, a, a, a local congregation when the Bible commands us not to be there, and you, the salvation plan you are hearing there is not in accordance with the Bible. It's a man-made salvation plan. Uh, that is not uh, that kind of a salvation plan is taught in all the churches, and and uh, the fact is that the Holy Spirit is not there to bless the word. Now the preacher may preach a sermon on uh, on a passage in the Bible and do an excellent job, but the Holy Spirit is not there to apply that to the hearts of any people, and that uh, actually. That preacher, whether he realizes it or not, is under the authority of Satan. He's really worshiping Satan. Now, we like to think, and we've been taught, uh, uh, I've been in the church most of my life and served as a deacon and as an elder, and I've been right in the heartbeat of the churches. I'm very, very familiar with, with church worship. And we like to think that the Sunday worship service, oh, that's when we worship. Well, yes, yes, maybe. Maybe I can also sit there and be dreaming about a vacation I'm going to start tomorrow or a plan of something that I'm designing, even while the preacher is preaching. And uh, and uh, but the preacher uh, may not uh, be e easy to understand, and so I'm confused at what he's saying. So it's very hard to really worship. I'll tell you, what really worship is, sit down. Sit down all by yourself. Put your Bible in your lap and read a passage from the Bible. And uh, read uh, pr praying, Oh, Lord, uh, help me to understand some of this that I'm reading here. And if I understand anything, Oh, Lord, help me to be obedient to it. And that is worship, where you're having conversation with God. He speaks to you through His Word. That's God speaking. You speak to Him through prayer. And, and you are uh, to worship means to bow down. You are looking to Him right there as being everything to you. Your Lord, your Master, your Teacher, your Savior. Uh, your, he is the giver of light. That is worship true worship and you're not being uh, you're not being uh, 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 interrupted uh, by uh, the uh, uh, the child that's sitting in the bench in front of you in the work service and keeps uh, 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 making noises or you're not being uh, uh, your thoughts are not going all, every place except uh, on the on the word of God you're trying to concentrate right there on the Word of God. 
And that is the worship that God has introduced in these final 6,100 days. We're not accustomed to it. I admit that. We're not a bit accustomed to it. It feels very uncomfortable. But I'll tell you, that's what we ought to be aspiring to. Don't neglect in, in, uh, ourselves. Don't neglect ourselves uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, receiving comfort from where? From the Word of God uh, as the day draws nigh. And uh, we want to spend much time in personal worship. But now we have to pause for this message. We're continuing with the open forum, and shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Mr. Campen. Yes. It, it, please do not take this um, um, any other way. The only thing I just me- want to tell you is allow people to talk or express their opinions, because there are too many times you jump on people's you know, voice, you know, you don't, you try to intimidate people when you are doing that. You don't allow people to express their opinions. You just, excuse me, excuse me. It does not make any sense at all. Well, let let me excuse, Uh, excuse excuse me, let me explain something. What is the nature of this program? You must bear in mind that there are hundreds of different denominations And the people who go to these churches believe what they have been taught. And each denomination has its spin, its idea about what this doctrine is or that doctrine is. The very fact that a person remains a Baptist and doesn't become a Roman Catholic is because he believes his Baptist doctrine is correct and the Roman Catholic is not. The next man believes that the Roman Catholic is accurate and not the Baptist, and so he remains a Roman Catholic. Now, if we were, if we had designed this program, and it is not designed this way, but if had we had designed it in order to be an open uh, place where anybody could air their opinion or their understanding of this doctrine and that doctrine, we could go on and on, uh, hour after hour, and never, never necessarily come to any truth at all. This is a teaching program in which we try to get right into the Word of God. And and so when somebody calls up and they begin uh, to teach their what they think uh, is truth, and if I find that that they're going down a path that is not true at all, I don't want to waste any more time on that. Let's get back to the verse, and let's get back to the truth. Now, I know that that's rough on on people who call. I know that's very rough, and it even may sound very impolite and and very not nice at all. But that's the only way we can make this program have any value. It has no value if we were simply here to listen to the various ideas or opinions or uh, doctrinal understandings of each one who called. We cannot have that kind of a program, I am sorry to say. All right. I do really appreciate your explanation. You took your time to explain. Thank you so much for this. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Mr. Camping. Yes. Can you uh, please explain to me, and I'll take your answer on the uh, over the air, uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verses 39 and 40. Hebrews 11, verse 39 and 40. There we read, and these all, talking about a whole list of individuals who, uh, who demonstrated that Christ was their Savior, uh, he is the faith that shows up. It's Christ, of course, that that c- can only be in view when we talk about faith that saves us because that is the work uh, that only Christ did. And in verse 39 it says, And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, that is through Christ, received not the promise, God having provided something better for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. 
Now, what... Uh, the, uh, try again. What could this be saying? You see, the promise that God has made to the true believers is more than the fact that we would become saved. That is, we would receive a brand new resurrected soul because that is literally what happens at the moment we uh, are, can say we have become saved. But that's not the full promise. The promise is that we are uh, to, to be with Christ in heaven forevermore, but we'll only be there when we have received our glorified spiritual bodies also. And God's plan is is that we will receive that at the time of the rapture. And so we could, we could paraphrase this maybe something like this. Uh, for, uh, uh, and these all having obtained a good report through, through Christ, received not the full, uh, the, uh, the full promise of everything that goes with salvation. God having provided something better for us. That is, uh, in addition to what we've already experienced on earth here, uh, that we are going to receive a new resurrected body, and we're going to be actually living in Christ, in heaven with Christ, or the new heaven and the new earth, and reigning with Him forevermore. And uh, that is not going to happen and, uh, to those of the past, nor to us, until everybody has become saved, and the time, line, time comes when that when when God is ready to put that into motion, which will be on May 21, in the year 2011. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, Brother Campy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I got a question for you. Um, you said, uh, according to the uh, Bible calculation. That's uh, October 21st, that's the, the last day of the earth, right? According to October 21, 2011, will be the day when God is going to destroy this universe with fire and it will cease to exist. All of it, everything connected with it, all of its works, all the people who are still alive on that day will all be completely annihilated it will cease to exist and there will be never any uh, remembrance of this of this uh, uh, time uh, uh, that we are now experiencing ok my question is after all this calculation did you pray and ask God if he's right did, did I pray and ask God if you are right if, oh, if let you me are tell you right. let me tell you let me tell you, and I say this very humbly, but I wouldn't go anywhere with the Bible if I were not constantly praying, praying for wisdom and praying that God might straighten me out if I start going down a wrong direction. I can't live without uh, asking God's help constantly, constantly, not not once a week, but uh, constantly, and, and uh, so... Uh, that's 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 just a given in the life of a true believer. Okay. Now, when you pray to God, what was the answer? Did He confirm it or no? Well, the answer, uh, <laughs> you know, the answer comes that uh, God guides us in into His Word. For example, I may be struggling with a verse and struggling and struggling, and then I and I'm praying and praying. And now and then, uh, at some point, I, 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 it comes to my mind, oh, maybe it's this. And so I check that out in the Bible, and I find, yes, that harmonizes with this verse and that verse and that verse and that verse. Uh, therefore, God certainly has opened my eyes to that. On the other hand, I have prayed over verses, and, and I still don't understand exactly why God has written what he has written, and so I know that it's God's good pleasure for me to just wait upon him, and maybe he'll never let me know what that particular word means or what, what, why that word is put there. Uh, this is, uh, this, uh, you know, when you're a child of God, you can have a very relaxed and, 
and uh, wonderful relationship with God. You you uh, come to the Lord pleading for His mercy, pleading for wisdom, pleading for direction, pleading for uh, 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 being faithful uh, to His laws and so on. And then you wait upon the Lord and... Uh, and uh, again and again, you find something more that you be, have begun to understand that you hadn't understood before. And so you know, yeah, God is God is uh, 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 giving me information. He doesn't uh, could do it through a dream or a vision or whatever. He just guides me into the Word of God. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Mr. Camping, how are you? Very well, thank you. Uh, Mr. Camping, my question, one of my questions is, would you say that your interpretation of Scripture is infallible? Is infallible? Yeah, is your, when you of read course the Bible... It, of and, course it isn't infallible. I'm, my interpretation is not infallible, but the fact is the Bible is infallible, and if I am reading the Bible accurately and and faithfully... Uh, then, then the uh, the conclusions are going to be infallible because they came from the Bible. But my interpretation, I can't say, is infallible. After all, who am I? I'm just a human being who is uh, searching the scriptures. And and uh, but I'll tell you, when uh, uh, when you begin to find proofs, and that's why I encourage people uh, to read the little booklet. We're almost there because that is a product of 50 years of intense study of the Bible, all summarized in those few pages. And, uh, and uh, uh, did I do the work accurately? Did I, uh, have I gone down wrong paths or whatever? And when I see the proofs that, that the Bible shows that would not be there if errors had been made, in the development of the timeline of history from the Bible, they would never be able to agree with those proofs. But because of those proofs, and there are, are a number of these, I am very convinced that by God's mercy, by God's mercy, He, he uh, guided these, this study uh, so that we have come up with accurate information. Yeah, but uh, I'm wondering, uh, so so are you saying that your interpretation of this particular topic, that the world's going to end in 2011, is infallible? It's infallible as the Bible is infallible. In other words, it agrees with everything the Bible teaches. And if the Bible is infallible, then yes, that is infallible. Yeah, but if, you, if, if, if there's a statement in the Bible that's clear, I mean, we could see, like, if it said, the world's going to end in 2011, then we would say that, well, that's what it says. But since it doesn't exactly look, say look, that, you have wh to... Why use that kind of language? We, you know, do I ask you, do you believe Christ is the Savior? Do you believe, is that an infallible truth? Is that an infallible truth? And you're going to answer, well, of course it is. That's what the Bible teaches. It's an infallible truth because it comes right from the Bible. And there's all kinds of evidence in the Bible that Christ is the Savior. Well, okay, anything that we get from the Bible that is, that is trustworthy and is uh, proven by the Bible, then we know that that truth is infallible because it is from the Bible. It's not from my mind. Come on now. It's not something because of my wisdom or, or smarts or whatever. It means that God simply has guided uh, me and others who have who've uh, who we've talked about these things uh together over the last fifty years on the open forum or the last forty five years at least uh because that's how long the open forum has been on uh, and we've talked about these things and as we talked about them together uh, God guided us into correction here and there and but what we the final product is that we find all these proofs and I would suggest. Please get a copy of We're Almost There and read it carefully, carefully, carefully. And then you can decide whether we have read the Bible correctly or not. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening. How are you doing? Very well, thank you. 
Yeah, I had a couple questions for you. Um, first, I just wanted to make a statement really quick. Um, I, I've kind of seen, a, well, first of all, you look at the first churches. Um, Paul started, pretty much started the first church and uh, in Acts and whatnot. And then, uh, it, it, you know, you see churches nowadays, some, you know, it might be misleading or whatnot. But um, I see a lot of churches trying to mimic that and to look for God's will. And um, why, uh, you know, I, I don't know why Satan would, you know, have a church that that does good things, that reaches out towards people, that 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 has people serve God and worship Jesus Christ. Well, come on, let's, let's think about this for a moment. Satan is the enemy of Christ. He wants to destroy everything that Christ. Uh, has done. He uh, that he is a sworn enemy against God, and when God placed him to rule in the churches, it was a fantastic opportunity for Satan to destroy what Christ had come had built up. Because the churches, the local congregations, started out as a as a divine institution instituted by God by God Himself. It was the major means by which God has been saving people such as to have become saved throughout the history of the world. And now Satan can be there and can actually uh, 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 guide the uh, people in the churches to, uh, further away from the truth of the Bible. What an opportunity uh, to destroy uh -huh. or to uh, okay. bring a strong delusion into those churches. My second thing that I have, there's been a lot of debate tonight listening. You know, this is the first time I've listened to you. My second question is, um, there's been a lot of debate on October 21st, 2011. I believe that that's what you said. Um, just, I haven't heard you say uh, what you, how you came up with this date. I have said this again and again. Get the little book. Good. Uh, we're almost there. It's free of charge. You can call for it, or oh, okay. you can download it okay. from the internet. It's too long to it's explain. It's a complicated. Okay. Excuse me. It's a very complicated calculation. Okay. It doesn't come out. It, you can't. I can't recite it to you in, in five minutes and, and expect right, right. you to okay. understand it. But on the other hand, uh, it, it it is it is all derived from the Bible, completely from the Bible. It is not a product of a vision, or of or hearing a voice, oh, or okay. through intuition. Yeah, okay. It is it is comes from the Bible, and then there are many proofs that come from the Bible that demonstrate that these dates are very accurate. And so whether you agree with that or not? That's your problem. No, I'm not. I was just kind of trying to clear up the debate in my head. But the last thing that what the main thing is is can someone who goes to church and worships Jesus Christ at church and doesn't believe in this date that you're talking about can they go to heaven? Well, you know the Bible. Uh, I, I I don't know what what God is going to do with any individual, but I do know that in our day. God well, is believe, excuse me, question. excuse me. God is separating the wheat from the tares. He spoke about that in Matthew 13, that at the end of time uh, he would separate the wheat from the tares. And there he uh, tells us that they, they were not to be separated throughout the church age, which extended over a period of 1,955 years, because the tares look so much like the wheat that you might be throwing out the wheat while you're trying to throw out the tares. So leave them, to, leave them be. And then at the end, we will separate them. Now, as we work through the, the timeline of history and the, and the details of the end, and God, we're living in that time when God has opened our eyes to a whole lot of revelation that has never been known before, we find that that the church age came to an end, and then that was immediately followed by a time that Matthew 24 and Mark 13 speak about as a time of great tribulation. And when we study that, we find, for example, in Revelation chapter 3, where it says that it is a time, a, a time of testing, a time 
uh, uh, when God is testing those in the churches to discover whether they are wheat or tares. Now, if they're tares, they are spiritually blind. They are still in the nighttime. Uh, they, uh, spiritually, they do not have the light of the gospel. And they're going to fail test after test. On the other hand, if they're wheat, uh, then they have the light of the gospel, and they will uh, slowly on uh, begin to uh, understand these things, and or uh, even if they don't completely understand them, they will realize that these uh, tests are what they are, and will want to obey them. Now that doesn't mean because somebody gets out of the church that automatically means he's a believer, but at least. Uh, the character of the true believer is that he will have an enormous desire to be faithful to every uh, uh, the Bible as in every test. Now, one of the big tests that God is that we know about today is what is how can we become saved? And every church fails that test because they have a man-made gospel where you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. But believing that, that will not work by itself because believing is a work that we do and the Bible is crystal clear that we can't be saved by our works. And we also have other information that shows that all the work was done by, by Christ and if we are trusting in anything that we've done, in our baptism, in our confession of faith or whatever it is, we are still not a child of God. Now, these are the kind of people, unfortunately, that occupy the churches. Every church has a program. If you follow the rules that we lay down, that we believe are very biblical, you will become a confessing member of this church. You will be, you can know that you are a child of God. And that is the way the church is designed. And right from the beginning, uh, it leaves uh, those people... Uh, unsaved because they are violating the the first test. Second test is uh, you got to you got to learn that Christ that Satan rules now in the congregation. The Holy Spirit has absented himself, and therefore you are to get out of the church. Third test that Christ uh, is not coming as uh, he's coming as a thief in the night for those who are in spiritual nighttime, but he's not coming as a thief in the night for the true believers who are in the light time uh, who are in the children of the day uh, they will know that uh, we can know something about the timeline the exact time when Christ is coming and so there are other tests that God has set and this is what God is using today to separate the true believers from those who are uh, uh, only thinking they're true believers they outwardly look like true believers but in actuality they're still under the wrath of God and this is why the churches for example today we've been teaching many of these things for the last 20 years and very few people in the churches are paying any t attention they don't want to know even though everything we teach just comes from the Bible that's all we ever talk about we never quote uh, scholars of the past like Martin Luther or John Calvin or Swingley or Knox or anybody else. We just quote from the Bible. We keep our focus always on the Bible. Yet the churches who presumably are the uh, steward, uh, the custodian of the Bible, don't want to know what we're teaching. They are really trusting in their church doctrines, not in the Bible and so on and so uh, it all it, it, we can see it all fit together and in all of this is predicted in the Bible it's all predicted in the Bible and in our day we're learning more and more to understand this but thank you for calling and sharing and shall we and of course if you're a first time listener anyone who's just listened to this program uh, you're in shock absolutely shock uh, because what we're teaching on family radio is not taught in any seminary, by any in any church, and yet all of it comes from the Bible. And we back it up with with uh, showing, uh, uh, sending out literature that show 
exactly where we found it in the Bible and and uh, what how we look at the Bible so that you can check it out for yourself. And all of this literature is free and postpaid. You don't have to pay for it. You can just call for it. Like uh, uh, three books right now that are, are very important is I Hope God Will Save Me, uh, To God Be the Glory, and we're almost there. They're all around 70 or 80 pages long. They're not that big, and yet they are dripping with information that we all ought to know about that comes right from the Bible. But And it's free to anybody who calls for it, or, or you can even download it from your Internet. Look up. Family Radio or uh, www.familyradio.com and there you'll find it uh, there and you can download it right from there tonight. But shall we take our last call tonight, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Brother Camping. How are you? Very well, thank you. Good. Um, before I ask, ask my question, I just wanted to say that years ago when I started listening to uh, Open Forum, and uh, family radio, I used to think you were crazy. And um, I, at first, when we were talking about, you know, the church age being over, was going to stop listening altogether because I just thought that was nuts. But uh, I kept listening because I thought, you know, this camping guy isn't just giving uh, opinions. He actually has scripture to support, you know, his beliefs. And so I said, okay, I'm going to prove this guy wrong. I'm going to call the open forum and, you know, let him have it. So I started to research the things that you were teaching. And uh, one of the things that, and after I researched these things, I started, God started opening up my eyes. And, of course, I, you know, there wasn't anything that I could call to say that, hey, you're wrong because I feel that you are right. Um, but one thing that I realized that I was, you know, doing wrong was that my, my hermeneutic was wrong. And I really feel that this is where a lot of people get hung up. They're not looking at the Bible uh, in the right way. And do, is there any books that you might have or, um, you know, teachings that uh, emphasize this? Because it's so important, you know, that you approach this with the right eyes. Because, you know, if you don't, you're not going to get it at all. Well, you're correct, of course. It is uh, that they, people have wrong hermeneutics. Uh, the best, or the first passage, and we, or our program is about over, but you might look at Mark chapter 3, or Mark, wait a minute, Mark chapter 4, and there you'll find that Christ said he spoke in parables. Uh, everything has a spiritual meaning. But now we're at the end. 